Hello and welcome to Tuesday night and Stockpiling 101.3. I'm hoping to wind up this particular series tonight, but I'm sure it won't be the last we talk about stockpiling. It's, it's one of those subjects that once you start, you just can't stop. It just goes on and on and on because there's so much to it. And it's so interesting for most people. It's fascinating for me. I just love stockpiling. So tonight I thought I'd quickly go over what we've done the last couple of weeks, just review roughly, you know, the why of a stockpile and how we start it. And then I want to talk about um, things like how you start it, or how you start your slush fund to build a stockpile, how to rotate it because that's really important and a whole lot of other little bits and pieces that all tie in with the subject but don't actually make a video on their own, although I'm sure we could probably try if we wanted to. So the why of stockpiling for bad times, for illness, for food shortages, for unemployment, for ease and peace of mind because you don't like grocery shopping all the time. So you'll stockpile and grocery shop once or twice or three times a year or whatever it is and live off your pantry. I know there's a lot of people that would do that automatically, they live remote, so they may have um, standing orders for every six months. We have friends in the far north of Queensland, up Cape York, and she has a six month standing shopping order that gets flown in and it's huge. It comes on crates, on um, pallets, gets flown into their property unloaded and that's what they've got to live on for the next six months they are pretty much um stuck on their property if it rains they can't get out often for weeks um apart from the fact that they have to look after a whole heap of stock so she does a massive stockpile grocery shop and she actually has like a little supermarket almost set up in a shed close to the house that actually has racks and everything goes on the racks and that's how she does her shopping. I have my shelves in my laundry, shelves in the shed. You've seen the laundry part of the laundry shelving um, where I keep our stockpile so it's not quite as, um, as nifty and as well set up as that. But those shelves, the two sets of shelves in the laundry and the one set in my shed hold the pretty much hold all the tinned and bottled goods that we use for a year. So it's not a great deal of space. Then I have the tubs. They're um, 55 litre tubs, the big 55 litre tubs on wheels that I use to store the plain flour, the self-raising flour and the rice. And they hold enough for the year in those tubs. If I pack them neatly, they'll, they'll work enough for a year in each tub and the tubs keep the um, rodents and insects out too. So I started stockpiling to save money, save time, save energy, but I started really stockpiling because I never ever wanted to not be able to feed my family. I never ever wanted to be in the position of suddenly finding we didn't have any money and we didn't have any food. Now, even when disaster struck, we were still able to feed ourselves and feed the kids. But it was an awful feeling to know that even when we went to the monthly shopping, you know, there was just that money for the, enough for the month. I didn't have any backup. So that's why I started my stockpile and that's how I started it. It's really important. You might not have that, that issue. You might be quite happy with what you've got. 
what happens if you get sick? If you're off work for a week and you're sick, and even if you've still got money coming in, can you be bothered grocery shopping? Even doing an online order and getting it delivered is not always practical. Trusting someone else to do the groceries for you is not always practical. So having a stockpile is a nice backup. And for me, it's my it's like my security blanket. My grocery stockpile is like my security blanket. And I think it is for quite a few people because then they know that to come what may, they'll still be able to eat, shampoo their hair, clean the house, put a Band-Aid on a skin knee because they've got those stockpiles built up. How to do it is slowly. It's not going to happen instantly. I really wish I could take a thousand dollars. Oh, I'd be in stockpile, I'd be in grocery heaven if I could do that. Take a thousand dollars, go to the supermarket, go to the um, green grocer, to the butcher, to the spice shop, to my soap outlet, all those places where I get all the things that go into our stockpile and just order enough for the year and put it away and then know it's done and start saving again so that next year I could do the same thing. I would love that. That would be wonderful, but it's not practical. You know, not a lot of people when they're starting out have that much spare cash. So you start off slowly and you start off by adding to your stockpile with leftover grocery money. So if your regular grocery budget is $50 and you only spend $45, you've got $5 left that you can use to add things to your stockpile and by looking for the half price items so that you're doing um you're doubling the value of your dollar when you do that it takes time it just takes time and it can be frustrating because i'm impatient i wanted it all at once but it took a while to get to where it is now and it will for you too the other thing to remember is that you start with things that you use all the time. So the breakfast cereals, um, the spreads, the peanut butter, the Vegemite, um, toothpaste, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, all those sorts of things that you use all the time. And they are often the expensive items on your grocery list as well. So if you shop and wisely and are able to stockpile those, then you've got a really good buffer. And of course, the more stockpiling you do on half price sales, the faster your stockpile will grow, but the more money it frees up for the next time. So it sort of swings and roundabouts, but it works. Now, I've got notes down here, so I don't, I really don't want to forget anything, but I probably will. Okay. I started by switching from weekly to monthly shopping. I talked about that. And someone, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name, asked the question, how did I, what did I do? How did I do it? I went from weekly to monthly, but then did I not buy the specials that came up before my shop or, or did I find money from somewhere else to buy them? What I did was I realized fairly quickly after disaster struck that we ate pretty much the same foods just in different versions so we ate mince but it might have been in rissoles or meatloaf or tacos or meatballs but it was still mince we you know had pretty much the same grocery items on the list all the time so i was able to um, know that my shopping list was pretty much always going to be the same things over and over and over and that helped with working out my grocery budget because the prices I kept a track of the prices and I knew what they were if something came on sale um, on my something on my shopping list came on sale before shopping day I would look to see how much we had and if I had to buy it on shopping day and if I did then I would cross it off the shopping list and go and buy it, take the money out of my grocery budget and go and buy it then so that I could take advantage of the specials. It sounds a bit fiddly, but it wasn't really because you go to the stores anyway for your milk or bread or, or whatever. 
So you just time it to go when the sales start and pick up your half price things. And that reminds me, I was a huge fan of rain checks and I still am to a certain extent. If something's a really good sale and I go and it's not available, I will ask for a rain check. Now, Coles, Aldi don't give rain checks. Coles and Woolworths do. I'm not sure about the smaller independents. Some do, some don't. It will depend on the supermarket. But Coles and Woolies have now got really, really mean with their rain checks and they limit the number of items you can get to six, I think, for Coles and I think it's six or four for Woolworths. And you only get two weeks to be able to go back and buy it, which is fine because if I had the money to buy it when I wanted it, I would put that money away until it came back in stock and I could get it at the rain check price. The rain checks used to be good though because you could get them for up to 12 months and you could choose the number of items you wanted. I sometimes, if it's a really good special, will ask for two or three or four rain checks so that I can get the number of items that I wanted um, to buy. Case in point, tea bags last year were a really good price at Coles, the cheapest they'd been for ages. And I wanted them, I needed them for the stockpile, but I wanted them anyway. And when, of course, when I got there, there were none on the shelf. So I went and I asked for rain checks and she gave me one for six. I could have six boxes for two weeks. So then I said, could I have another rain check, another three rain checks because I actually wanted... Well, I actually wanted 20 boxes, but 24 would do. 24 boxes of tea bags, which led to a really interesting conversation with this lady because she talked about how she did the same thing when they were on half price or whatever. She'd buy double, you know, buy them and put them away. And she had a little store store cupboard, she called it, with a few basics in it that she bought on sale to save money. And we had a lovely chat. And she wasn't real keen on giving me the extra rain checks but I did persevere politely and nicely to get them so that I could go back and get the tea bags that I wanted on sale so I've done that with coffee I've done it with shampoo I've done it with tinned tomatoes and tinned beans um, at Woolworths so don't be afraid to get a rain check think about if you go to the store and what you want isn't there ask for a rain check go to the service desk and ask for a rain check and then you've got a bit of time to be able to buy it on sale can you explain to Priya what exactly a rain check is yes Priya rain checks are if you go to the supermarket like I did to Woolworths and they were out of the tea that was advertised on sale I you go to the service desk and you ask for a rain check and it's a voucher that um, they will fill out for you and they'll put the date on it. They'll write the the item you want. So in my case, it was Twining's tea bags. They'll write the price that you are to be charged, which will be the sale price, and a quantity, which the maximum was six. So six and the expiry date. And unfortunately, with Coles now, it's only two weeks, but it doesn't really matter because, as I said, if you had the money to buy them, when you got the rain check, you just put the money aside until you go back to get them. And that's a rain check. It's just a little slip of paper that they will give you. I tuck them into the back of my purse with my FPOS card so I don't lose them. Simple. And it just means that you don't miss out on a really good um, bargain. Now, you can get rain checks on all sorts of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be on grocery items. You can ask for them in department stores. They don't advertise that they do them. And they don't do them on all things that are on sale. But sometimes, if it's something that you've gone to get, towels or whatever, and it, they're all gone, go to the service desk, ask for a rain check. They may or may not give them to you. But sometimes, usually they will. So it's not just grocery items that can get rain checks. Hope that helps because they're really handy. It saves that frustration of missing out on a really good sale. 
because somebody else beat you to it. So it's been me or Wendy or Maureen and we've just been and cleared the shelves because if it's a really good price and I've got the money in my slush fund to do that, I will clear the shelf. So you've got to be early, get in quick or ask for a rain check. Okay, now, sorry, folks, lost my spot. Right, the slush fund. Paying for all of this. You have your grocery money, obviously, your grocery budget. For me, it's a $320 a month. Um, I know roughly how much my groceries are going to come to. It'll be about $240. Leaves me $80, which is, you know, enough for milk and cheese and fresh fruit and veg, $60. No, $320 to $240. Oh, yeah. oh. Do $300. Yeah. No, $80. Ignore. Just had a hard day at work. Um, that's enough for my, you know, top ups that I need of fresh fruit and veg and stuff. So that works that way. But sometimes the, I might not need everything on my grocery list, so I'll have some money left over, and that is what starts my slush fund. And I keep a separate purse for that. That money goes into the slush fund. I don't always spend it straight away. Sometimes it can build up for a couple of months. Sometimes it can build up for three or four months before something really good comes on sale. And then I use that money to buy it. So it might be a super fantastic price on butter. Please put butter on sale. If that, you know, I got really excited a couple of days ago. I was reading through some posts and Aldi had butter on sale and then I realised it was Aldi in another country, not in Australia and I was devastated. I was so excited. I had visions of butter filling my freezer. But, you know, if that happened, I would have money in the slush fund to go and buy as much as I could to save that money. It means that the slush fund means that I never go over my grocery budget. At the end of the year, I will still have just spent the $320 a month, but I will have got more than $320 worth of food, grocery items for that money because I've been able to not spend every cent that comes in and wait for sales, if that makes sense. I hope it does because it's a really good way to build your stockpile and that will help build your stockpile very quickly if if you um, use your slush fund money. Now I know some people on really low grocery budgets find it difficult to build a slush fund. Even if it's just a dollar. Put it aside. You've got a dollar left over in your grocery money. Put it in the slush fund purse or envelope or whatever you've got and let it build up until you've got enough money to buy whatever is on half price. And it works really well if you just use it for half price um, items or really good meat specials because meat's a really expensive grocery item at the moment. Um, sorry, and I do need new glasses, I've decided. Okay, the other thing is if something's on sale and I don't have any money in the grocery budget for it, then we miss out. Swings and roundabouts, you know. That's the way it is. I miss out. I get to do, um, make do with what we've got, save a bit more money, and then perhaps next time comes on sale, I'll have the cash. If I don't have the cash, I don't buy it. There's no point in having a grocery budget just to blow it every month in the um, mistaken, the mistaken thought that you are saving money. You're not saving money if you just keep doing it over and over and at the end of the year you've gone way over your grocery budget. You might have a whole lot in the pantry and in the fridge and the freezer, but if you keep adding to it instead of using it, you're just spending money. You're not saving money. Okay. Question? 
Uh, Maureen just said, luckily for you, Wendy and I don't live so close and stop piling. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very lucky, Maureen, that Wendy's down there, you're over there and I'm here, because otherwise we'll be cat bites in the supermarket. Uh, 301Jules wants to know how many purses um, do you have, have and carry? Oh, okay, 301Jules. I have my everyday purse. I have my slush fund purse. I have, oh, this is, do, do I sound like a complete nut, a fool and nut, nut case? Everyday purse, which is just the money that I use. It has my mad money in it. It has um, a little bit of um, emergency money that's tucked away in a zipper just in, uh, just in case something happens and I need cash type thing. The everyday purse has my flexi card, my uh, MasterCard and stuff like that in it. And that's the one I carry with me most of the time. Slush fund purse, which is where I transfer the spare grocery money into if there's any. And I do only take that with me if I'm going grocery shopping. I have um, a little purse, a little coin purse that I put all our 50 cent pieces into and all my gold coins that money um is usually changed from stuff i've bought oh, thank you i don't carry them all with me okay we'll go over them in just a moment um but i do use it save it up so that perhaps if there's something special happening like last weekend we went when and i went away for the weekend we went camping we had a wonderful time but on the way home, we decided to stop and have a coffee and an ice cream. Oh, so I used that money out of my little coin purse to pay for the coffee and ice cream. And then I have um, a fuel purse that lives in the car that's got my petrol money in it. And that's pretty much me done. Then, oh, grocery shopping. Sorry, my grocery money purse. I think there's another one. So that's five. I don't carry them all with me all the time. <laughs> I'd be weighed down and walking like this. But um, it's easier for me to do that than it is to keep track of it, of the spending in a spreadsheet. I work on a cash budget. I go to the bank. I get out what we need, put it into the purses, and away we go. That's it. It's easily, it's done. And when there's no money in the purse, we don't buy whatever that purse is for. So no grocery money in the grocery purse. We'll have to eat off the stockpile. Now, these are Hannah's purses, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. She doesn't carry them with her all the time, and she's going to tell us what they're for. Okay, little purse, grocery money. Grocery money. That's the slush fund purse. Slush fund purse. That's my pocket money. Pocket money. Uh, that's the Christmas and birthday fund purse. Christmas and birthday fund. That's the footy purse. Footy purse. Uh, that's outings. Outings. That's hair and makeup and stuff. Hair and makeup and stuff. And that's petrol. Petrol. Okay. So they're her purses. All all different colours. She doesn't carry them all with her all the time. She does exactly what I do, goes to the bank, gets out the cash, puts it in her purses. Do you do that weekly, fortnightly or monthly? I do it weekly, so I get out weekly. the cash for the week. She yeah. gets out her cash for the week, puts it into her purses, and away she goes. Now, the um, Christmas and birthday purse build up. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yep. Same with your hair and makeup because you don't buy that stuff all the time, so it builds up. Yeah, there you go. There are purses. A bit like the old-fashioned envelope system, which I used for years and years and years, and I still have the envelopes tucked away in the bookcase, but slightly prettier with the sparkles because some of my purses are sparkly and pretty too. Okay. So does that, answer, does that make sense and answer the question? We don't carry them with us all the time only when they're needed and it just means you don't overspend you don't go over budget for any single category like that i have a separate bank account for christmas birthdays i have a separate bank account for holidays and trips and i have a separate bank account for um 
household maintenance things. So if I need to replace linen or the dishwasher or that's the account I would use to do that. Interest rates got too low to do that. Hannah said the interest rates got too low and the fees were too high to be bothered doing that. So she just does it in cash in her purses. It's old fashioned and it's pretty basic, but it absolutely works. There will be people that will try and tell you that it is not the way to go, it is not the way to budget. If it works, then it most certainly is the way to budget. <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't work, then you know there's no point. Having um, a whole one card and doing everything on it, paying it off at the end of the month is fine. But you actually don't have any record or any way of tracking what you are spending your money on. You would still need to do a tracking sheet. Whereas this way we know I get the receipts, tuck the receipts into the purse and then at the end of each week, I just quickly go through, tally them up, put them into my book. I put my receipts in my slush fund purse because I've always got that with me. Hannah puts her receipts straight into a slush fund purse because she always has that with her. Isn't she clever? She's so organised. She's grinning over there. She should be on camera explaining this to you, shouldn't she? Okay. And she's saying, next week. Next week, folks. She said, next week. I get to have a rest. You can look at some other pretty face and not mine. Oh, now I'm on holidays. Okay, so once you've done all that, <laughs> we'll get back to stockpiling, sorry. Once you've done all that and you actually have your grocery items in your pantry or on your shelves or under your bed or in the shed or wherever, you need to remember to rotate. So as you bring new food in, it goes to the back and the oldest comes to the front so that you are always using the oldest first. So um, when I bring in a new tray of tomato soup, it goes to the bottom and I use from the top. When I bring in a new um, packet of flour, it goes to the back and I use from the front. So I'm always putting the new stuff at the back or on the bottom and using from the front or the top. So the oldest is always used first. That way you should never have anything that's out of code on your shelves and it should always still be perfectly edible and safe. With tin goods, you've got at least two years of shelf life um, before the, they start to change colour and texture and flavour, depending on what it is. So that's, that's a long time. Your dry goods will pretty much last indefinitely if they are stored um, dry and cool and in the dark. She's waving her hand at me. Is there a question? No, I'm just talking to oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. So um, remember to put your dry goods in your freezer so your pastas, beans, lentils, nuts, things like that go into the freezer. I put the flour in the freezer. Excuse me, cereals go into the freezer uh, before they go into the shelves. I just look, seven days, kills off any um, weevils that might be in there that could cause an issue. Um, I leave it in the freezer until I'm ready to put it up on the shelves. So minimum seven days, let them freeze, cleans everything out, then you bring it out, put it on your pantry shelf and... You're good to go. You should never have pantry moths or weevils like um, if you do that. Excuse me, I need a drink. I'm getting hoarse. Okay. Now, someone asked the question of um, for a basic stockpile, what would you have? You would have flowers, so self-raising, plain, corn flour at least um i have gluten flour because i use it in baking um rice flour because we use it in shortbread um sugar so just white sugar because you can make brown sugar you can move brown sugar rice pasta even if it's just um spaghetti or noodles of some kind 
um, tinned soup, so tinned tomato, cream of chicken, cream of mushroom, cream of celery, whatever you use. Um, bicarb soda and vinegar because they're good in cooking, of course, making pickles and stuff like that, but also for cleaning. Um, nuts, almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts are the three that I keep because they're the three that we like. But you could have pecans, you could have um, peanuts. We don't eat peanuts, but you could have them, um, anything like that. Again, your nuts go in the freezer and they'll keep forever in the freezer, so they're good. Um, legumes, so lentils, um, dried beans, kidney beans, um, navy beans, that sort of thing. Soup mixes, the dry soup mixes are always good to have on hand. Chocolate. I know it sounds rather extravagant, but seriously, chocolate is a really good food to have in your stockpile. It's a good source of energy if you're absolutely desperate, but it's also really versatile. You can melt it and add it to milk to make a hot chocolate drink. You can chop it up and put it into baking. You can use it for icings. You can use it for flavouring um, desserts and things too. So chocolate, and again, chocolate will store in the freezer. Canned veg. We're not big on canned veg in Australia, but... They have their place. I use them a lot when we go camping because just for sheer ease. But peas, beans, corn, carrots, asparagus, beetroot, that sort of thing are really handy to have on the shelves for emergencies. Um, more so than in your freezer because the power goes out and you've got a freezer full of veg or you've got to eat it all at once. Whereas tinned veg will keep on your shelf for a long time. What are you laughing at? <laughs> um, Alicia B is up to 12,200 steps and counting. Please don't say chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 12,200 steps. Well done. Also, Susan would like to know um, how long do tin, tinned items last because they don't always have the best before date on them. Right. Um, tinned, tinned things like your tinned fruits, your tinned soups, um, tinned veggies, baked beans, spaghetti, beetroot, pile, that sort of stuff will keep at least two years. Um, if It should last indefinitely if the tin is um, whole. And by that I mean it hasn't rusted, it hasn't blown. If you pick up a tin and you can see the top of it's sort of puffed up, toss it. Um, it means the contents are not good to eat and you will get sick if you eat them. Um, there will be a little pin prick or something or it hasn't sealed properly coming from the um, factory. So don't eat ever eat a tin that's blown like that. But pretty much they will last, they say two years on the shelf before they start to um, deteriorate in colour, texture, taste, appearance, but they'll still be good to eat. They won't be so pretty to look at, but they'll still be fine to eat. They won't make you sick as long as they are whole and perfectly good tins, not rusted, not dented, not blown like that. Fine. Um, ditto for the um, preserved fruit and veggies, you know, the old Fowler's Bacola type home preserved fruits and veggies will last for years and years and years. Again, the colour, the texture, the flavour will change, but it will still be safe to eat. And I don't know why they don't have a best before on tinned goods. Maybe they just assume that we all just know, not all of us do. Okay. Um, Tin fruit, back to the list, sorry guys, tin fruit, jam and honey, condiments, um, things like tomato sauce, soy sauce, Worcestershire sauce, barbecue sauce, mustard, so dry mustard, the powder, and um, wet mustards as in Dijon or whole grain or whatever. Uh, salt is a really good thing to have in your stockpile. It's not only good for flavouring, but it's a great preservative 
for a lot of things. So that's a skill. Salting is a skill that we've probably all lost, but it's a really good method of preserving. No, I think you need to. Sorry? I can salt the earth. <laughs> um, pepper, vanilla, uh, relishes, chutneys, um, pickles, mayo, spices, so cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, cardamom, um, those sorts of things. Mixed spice, all those sorts of things. Then your herbs. So your mixed herbs, basil, rosemary, oregano, um, garlic, all those sorts of dried onion flakes, those sorts of things are all really good to have if you use them. If you don't use them, don't keep them. There's no point in having things that you're not going to use. It's a waste of money and a waste of space. Um, then in your fridge, you could have a little stockpile of cheese, of butter, of sour cream, eggs, um, meat in the freezer, pastry, um, frozen veg, that sort of thing. could all go and be a little fridge freezer stockpile that you've got put away there. They're all basic things that you could probably live off quite easily for just about ever because they're basic ingredients and you can use them to make so many different meals. Like, so the flour, you've got flour and sugar and you add an egg and some milk, you've got pikelets. Um, if you have pasta and tomato soup, some herbs, um, throw in some lentils or something, you've got a pasta sauce. Put it over spaghetti or put it over noodles. Sprinkle it with a bit of cheese. You can use um, ground nuts and rice to make rissoles. You can do fried rice. You can do rice pudding. You can do rice custard. You can do all sorts of things. Um, my quick rice patties with peanut butter, Vegemite rice, mixed herbs, onion, done really good now I want them so all sorts of things so if you've got a basic start with a basic list of the ingredients you use the most work from that and your stockpile will build quite easily and quite um, usefully and use it that's the other thing it's not for looking at. I mean, it's really nice to stand there and see everything all, all laid out and know that it's there and it's it's lovely looking at it, but it's even better to use it. Don't be afraid to use it. It's supposed to be used. You're meant to go there every week and do your shopping, your stockpile before you head to the supermarket. So go to your stockpile, choose what you've got, Make a list of the things that you don't have and it's the things you don't have or what you're going to buy. You shop at home first and shop from your stockpile. It's re really, really important to use it because otherwise you put a lot of money into something that's just decorative for what purpose. So even if times aren't tough, use it because you can rebuild it times aren't tough you're using your stockpile but when you're shopping you're rebuilding your stockpile by replacing the things that you use so don't be afraid to use it it's meant to be used it's not a pretty thing although it is but it's not decorative it's meant to be used no no okay all right now more notes so folks um I haven't covered shopping in bulk because I think that's almost a whole video on its own, a whole session on its own because there's so much that you can do. But it's a good way, if you can, to, to buy some things in bulk. So meat is easy to buy in bulk. Um, some fruit and veg is easy to buy in bulk. Buy in bulk the things that you use. Um, for instance, um, toilet paper. You know, if you can get it in bulk and it's cheap enough, you'll use it. So it, it's a good buy. 
but you know 45 cases of smoked oysters and tomato sauce even if they're just 10 cents a, a case is not a, a a great buy if you don't use them if you don't like them if you're never going to serve them to anyone so you know think before you buy in bulk and think about what bulk is to you because i often get the giggles when i go and it will be you know, a bulk buy and it will be 2.5 kilos of chicken wings well for our family, 2.5 kilos of chicken wings isn't bulk. 25 kilos is bulk to me. But to a single person, you know, 2.5 kilos of chicken wings is a lot. So think about what bulk means to you and know your prices because just bulk means more. It doesn't mean cheaper. So buying in bulk is not necessarily saving you money. If you don't know your prices, you don't know the unit price, then find out before you make the purchase because it's not necessarily cheaper. People rave about Costco and how cheap it is. Costco isn't cheap. It's just not cheap. You are paying a premium for the, the goods that are there I think the meat, fruit and veg at Costco is outrageously priced. I think I've said that before. But even their pretty much their basic grocery items aren't any cheaper than you will get at Aldi or Coles or Woolworths. And on top of that, you've paid a membership fee. So you need to factor that in too. Again, bulk means more, not cheaper. So think about it before you go to buy... Um, buy in bulk and if you don't have one and you are serious about buying in bulk serious about saving money serious about stockpiling consider investing in a deep freeze a small one to start with look for second hand our first freezer I paid $50 for and it lasted us for 15, 16 years and it was old when we got it. It did a brilliant job for $50. It was just a medium-sized chest freezer and I kept it full all the time but it saved us a fortune in that time and paid for itself over and over and over when it finally died and couldn't be repaired, I bought a reconditioned freezer that was actually bigger and it was $300. Oh, that hurt. But it's still going strong 10 years later. So I haven't had a problem with it. It does what it has to do. And again, it's paid for itself over and over and over. Freezing food is a good way of storing it for long term so think about it i think freezers should come you know standard in every household but that's just me if you're serious about buying in bulk is serious about um stockpiling and saving money a freezer is a good investment and think of it as an investment because it will help um, save you money and stretch your grocery dollar further. Okay. Right, now. Oh, and with your stockpile, be selective. Be very selective. If there's no point in buying a 500 gram tin of Nescafe and put it in your stockpile, even if it is only $12, if no one in the family drinks coffee and you only have it on hand for visitors. That's a waste of money and a waste of space. Think about it. Be selective. Um, and sometimes we end up with too much. We just end up with too much. 
for whatever reason. It was a really good deal on beetroot. We ended up with too much. If it's not out of code, consider donating it to a food pantry, sharing it with friends, family, neighbours, co-workers, um, or whatever. Don't just let it sit on your shelf and take up space. If you're not going to use it, you've got too much, you know you're not going to use it, or perhaps your tastes have changed or for some reason your dietary needs have changed and you're not going to be able to use something, then donate it. If it's still in code and still perfectly good, donate it. Get it out of the house, free up that space for something that you will be using. Really, um, supermarkets, um, people, the manufacturers have put um, goods and supermarket shelves, pay a premium for that shelf space. Think of your stockpile and the shelf space it takes up as premium shelf space. Move out the stuff that's not being used so that the stuff that you can use is going into that shelf. That's premium real estate. You want to get the best value out of it that you possibly can. So think about it. Um, sorry, guys. Yeah. Yeah, don't know. Food, food pantries, friends, neighbours, older family members perhaps that um, are on a lower income might appreciate make up a basket, a hamper, and drop it off to them or leave it on your doorstep anonymously with a thinking of you card, something like that. But, yeah, move it out, free up that shelf space. Okay. I've, um, I think I've run out of ideas for now. No more questions? No? No? Everybody's happy? Yeah. Susan said that she made the sausage rolls and they were here in her pen. She's not going to keep a stockpile of them in her freezer. <laughs> sausage rolls, yum. Do you know, um, Susan, if you um, make them, roll them, you can flash freeze them un uncooked so that you can just take them out of the freezer and pop them into the oven and cook them from frozen. You'll need to add about 10 minutes to the cooking time. 10 to 15 minutes depending on your oven to the cooking time but they will be um, freshly baked and you can do that with muffins and cakes and biscuits and things to uh, make the dough freeze it and then cook it from frozen just you just need to extend the cooking time a little bit and it really will depend on your oven as to how long so the first time you do it just watch make sure check it make a note of it so that next time you know your sausage rolls from frozen are going to take 35 minutes instead of 25 or whatever but it's a great way to do it and a really big saving for you quick lunches on the weekend quick school lunch box fillers quick party food you can you know imagine visitors come and you can whip up little sausage rolls pull them fresh out of the oven they'll be gobsmacked and be saving a fortune and I'm glad everyone liked them. Okay, so nothing else? Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, you might wind me up for tonight. How are we going for time? Quarter past. Quarter past. Well, here we go. So if you've got no more questions, now is the time to ask. But if you have no more questions, no? You've got to give them time to type them up. No more questions? Oh, I'm impatient. I oh, know. Okay. Oh, Annie. <laughs> Hi, Annette. Annette would like a video on chest freezer organisation. Um, yes, I'd happily do one. I won't be able to do it live, I don't think, because I'm not sure we'll be able to get the camera and the lights. Oh, you never know. Get it all to work in, in where the freezer is. But I'd love to because I use bags. I use coloured bags to organise my freezer because I'm short and I fall in and get grumpy and it works really well so yes I would happily do a freezer organization that would work well for me uh, okay Lisa Norris has said so many things have to be refrigerated once they're open now things like jams that used to be able to keep be kept in the pantry 
why can't you keep your jam in the pantry? Sauces, if it's something that um, has always been on the pantry shelf, keep it in the pantry. I make jam so it just goes from the shelf to the shelf to the pantry, but, you know, that's it. Um, the only sauces we keep in the fridge are the mayo. Yeah. The aioli. Yeah. The pesto. The pesto. We keep the relishes in there. And I do keep my relishes, like the zucchini pickle and the tomato chutney, go into the fridge, but they never last long, so they're not in the fridge very long anyway. And so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karen Turner. Oh, Karen Turner. Oh. 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 Okay, so. Yes, we do vaccine a lot. Sorry? Maureen asked, do we vaccine a lot? Yes, Maureen, I vacuum seal just about everything. In fact, if Hannah could dive quickly to the fridge, bottom. In the cheese, in the, God, that makes it, in the big cheese box, yeah. there's a packet of, from the weekend. I vacuum seal everything. I love my vacuum sealer. I, um, and we went camping at the weekend. This is how I do our veggies when we go camping. Now, this is potato and onion with some herbs and some, I've already put the oil and the herbs in it and I vacuum sealed it and for camping, they last for ages like this so they're really good to do at home too but it just means when we're camping I don't have messes in the fridge but to cook it, all I do is drop that packet into um, a big pot of boiling water cook it for about 15 minutes, take it out, open it and tip it into the fry pan to brown and we have our baked veggies while everything else is cooking in the camp oven and it's really quick and easy now. You can do that at home too. Put it into a big pot of water, let it cook, open it and then brown them off in the frying pan if you want to. You don't have to put the oven on for roast veggies. Now, if you do veggies, if you buy a whole pumpkin, for instance, you can um, cut it up, peel it if you like it peeled, take the seeds out, dust it with a little corn flour, and that just stops it from going slimy. You know, pumpkin goes slimy. Vacuum seal it. So if I do, do a whole pumpkin, I have five pieces of pumpkin laid across in a bag. I vacuum seal them, put them into the bottom of the fridge. Now, they're good for about three to four weeks like that in the bottom of the fridge. It just keeps it a little bit longer. With the um, bags, <clears throat> sorry, getting hoarse again, with the bags, if they just have veggies in them like cauliflower or pumpkin or whatever, I trim them off really close to the doing, wash them, dry them, and I will reuse them. I don't reuse the bags that have had meat in them or chicken in them. Uh, but I do reuse the bags that have just have veggies or dry goods in them. They keep for, um, for ages. I did the same thing with the crumble mix. I made crumble mix um, before we left, popped it into the vacuum sealer, sealed it up, and um, it just packs easier. It stores better. It lasts longer. So much easier. Vacuum sealing is a really, really good thing to do. It makes your, it keeps your meat up to Is it twice as long? three times longer in the fridge and about four times longer in the freezer. So it's well worth um, another really good investment if you do a lot, if you do a lot of um, bulk buying again, a really good investment. I have flour over on my shelves. I buy myself flour in 25 kilo um, bags. And I portion it out into two kilo lots. Oh, two kilos of heavy. And I vacuum seal it. Pop them in the freezer. And then 
when I'm ready to take them out of the freezer, they just go onto the shelves when I'm ready to use it into the canister. Again, trim off across there, tip it out, wash them, and I can reuse the um, bag again. So, are the bags expensive? Um, okay. If you buy sunbeam bags, they're very expensive. They're at $30 for two rolls. I buy um, the bags, I buy some pre-made bags and I buy some rolls to make my own bags from Aldi and they're half the price there, $14.99 for two rolls. You can buy them online but if you do that you've got to factor in postage and I think Kmart might sell them as well and they're about the $14 or $15 mark in Kmart as well. So I... Um, these are Aldi, work really well. I'm happy with them. I've, I haven't had a, a problem with them yet, so. Maureen has Grandma's tuna patties defrosting in the fridge for tomorrow night, which have been wrapped sealed. Should she reuse the bags? Um, That's a good question. Wash them. Maureen's asking about, she's had tuna patties in the bag. Okay, I, okay. I would reuse the bags, but I'd, I'd wash it in hot soapy, hot soapy water, in, turn it inside out, give it a good wash in hot soapy water, rinse it, tip it upside down, make sure it's dry. And tomorrow's going to be sunny, so hang it on the clothesline in the sun. Just nothing sterilises like the sun. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? this and oh, oh it's gone chat keeps refreshing on me and I'm gonna I've got things flashing before my eyes oh, okay what about what I grow in my garden okay yeah. Karen T uh, at the moment there's nothing in the garden strawberries in the garden um nothing I've pulled out all the summer crops I've added um, a layer of compost and a new lot of potting mix to the boxes and that's as far as I've got hoping this weekend that I will be able to get cauliflowers and cabbages and broccoli in and I really quickly need to get in the turnips and parsnips because they um, plant come from seed so I like to get those in early, but it's really been too warm um, to do those at the moment. The turnips and parsnips like cold soil, and the soil at the moment is just too warm. We had the hottest Melbourne day in April, 50 years today. It got to 31, I think, here today. So it's throwing the gardening out a bit. Our poor old apple tree still has green leaves on it. It hasn't even started to drop its leaves yet. Um, but come winter, there will be cauliflowers, cabbages, broccoli, silver beet, um, the turnips and the parsnips because I love baked parsnip and I use turnips in stews and casseroles and soups. So I love baked parsnip and parsnip chips. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. so good. Um, so they will be all growing hopefully. I get them in this weekend. It won't matter so much for the brassicas, but the other things really need cold soil. Now, I grow the mini cauliflowers and the mini cabbages okay. because one mini is about so big, yay, big. So one head of mini cauliflower, one mini cabbage is enough, one mini cauliflower is enough for one meal for us. And one mini cabbage does two meals for us. So there's no waste and I don't have to worry about it going black and mildewy in the fridge before I can use it up again. So that's why I grow the minis. There's no waste with them. They don't take up quite as much space as the big ones, but they grow just the same. They taste just the same. They look just the same. They're just smaller. Um, silver beet. I use 
in soups and stews and casseroles and I shred it up and it goes really nicely in rice. So we use that. I think that I've got rainbow in at the moment in the seeds. So they're what I had. So that's what we're eating. Uh, um, okay. My, okay, Maureen's asking, are my mini cabbages and cauliflowers from seed? Yes. Now, if you're a Diggers Club member, you can buy what they call speedlings, which are seedlings of the minis um, from Diggers Club to get started if you haven't started them from seed, yeah. Jess would like to know, are the vacuum sealer machines from Aldi good? Yes, vacuum sealer from Aldi is fine. My only issue with it was... Because you got spoiled. Because I got spoiled, yes. Because I was spoiled with the Sunbeam Food Saver. My only issue with the Aldi unit was it doesn't have a blade to cut the bags, to cut the rolls. So you have to measure it out, cut it with scissors, then seal the end. It was just a... If you just do it when you buy the rolls... It just me being fussy and pernickety, I know, but otherwise it works really, really well. I've tried um, the Kmart one, which was about $35 or something, an Aldi unit and the food saver. I've had, I'm on my second food saver. I wouldn't waste my money on the Kmart vacuum sealer. I felt it didn't have a strong enough vacuum. It didn't it didn't suck enough air out um, to do as good a job. The Aldi one, as far as um, the vacuuming, was comparable to the Food Saver. Uh, it was just, like I said, just that one little feature that was missing from it that I just really bugged me. So I'm now on my second Food Saver, which... Um, I was given for Christmas as a Christmas gift and I love it, love, love, love it. So I wore the first one out, completely, I mean wore it out, I just wore it out because it just vacuum sealed everything and yeah, but vacuum sealers are a good kitchen, kitchen tool and you will use it, you really will use it. So, yeah. Um, Cass's Thanks again for the help. She's learned a lot, even though she's been a cheat to get for years. I've still learned so much from seeing you boys on a Thursday. Have a great week. Oh, thank you, Kat. You have a great week too. Uh, I'm glad I can still teach someone or share something that's useful with someone. Because sometimes I just think I'm not, just I have so much going through my mind. I worry that it's just going to spill out. Any ideas on how to keep the rabbits and rodents out of the veggie patch? <sighs> snakes. snakes. Rubber snakes. My mother swore by rubber snakes. She had quite a collection of them, didn't she? Grandma had oh, I don't know, a dozen or so, all different sizes and colours, and she rotated them so that they wouldn't get used to them and she put them in different spots. But rubber snakes, try rubber snakes, $2 shop. Toy shops, Kmart might have them, I don't know, reject shop, somewhere like that might work. And um, spraying with a mixture of cayenne and water because mm. they don't like the pepper burns and they don't like it. Okay, Jess would like to know. That should be a whole video. Camping on a budget. Camping on a budget. I have so many I, things that I do when we go camping. Jess, Jess Cole is um, asking about other tips for camping and camp recipes. Oh, my goodness. So many of them. I'll share a quick one with you. I think I might have shared this with some of you before, but it's um, my favourite party trick so to speak, when we go camping. So you need aluminium foil, two good sheets, two nice big long sheets of aluminium foil, spread them out, um, either a tub or a tube of cream cheese, like the Philly-style cream cheese, but I don't buy the Kraft one. I buy Aldi or Coles, which I'm 
And at the time, Ali doesn't always have it. So sometimes I'm stuck with the coals in the tube. That's fine. Pop that into the middle of your foil. Then you are going to get a jar of salt. So you can use hot, medium, mild, whatever, Aldi, Coles, Old El Paso, whatever. Plop it over the top of the cream cheese. That's so all easy and drizzly. Huh? Then make a parcel. So you sort of gather the sides of the foil up and twist it round. So it's a, sit that on the edge of your campfire for about 20 minutes and the cheese gets all hot and melty and the salsa gets warm. So when you open it, open it out, um, the foil forms a little bowl. Then you just use corn chips or potato chips or crackers to scoop it out as a dip. Now, I've been doing that for I don't know how many years. Every time we go camping, we go away quite a lot with a with the same group of people and that's my that is my contribution to pre-dinner nibblies on one of the nights and they always ask for it if I don't have it I'm asked where it is and why didn't I do it could you use tomato relish you could use tomato relish you could use corn relish if you wanted to um but it works really well with the salsa and the corn chips that's so good and it feeds about 10 men, I suppose. There's yeah, usually about 10 of us, so about oh, 10 men, a couple of women. So it's actually quite inexpensive as a nibbly to do. Now, I do I only do it when we go camping. I don't know why I don't do it at home. We don't have to camp, but I could do it in the oven at oh, home if you wanted to. Um, but it's really good really really good okay when you buy the sausage mince in bulk do you portion it out and vacuum seal it yes when i buy my sausage mince in the five kilo huge great big huge plastic bags that comes in five kilos i lug it home and i get out the scales and i get out the vacuum sealer and i make um the bags and i weigh it out in one kilo lots drop it into the bag and before I seal anything in the vacuum sealer, if it's mince and it goes in in a clump, so I squash it all down so that it is flat like that. Um, it seals better but it stacks so much better in the freezer and it thaws faster when I do that and I vacuum seal it. Um, now, Maureen was asking when I, where do I buy the sausage mince in bulk from Australian butcher? Tasman do it, Kate, still um, Yes, I used to, before I went to Australian butcher and I was shopping at Tasman, um, I would sometimes get it there too. Check your price. I haven't shopped at Tasman for a long time because it's just too far to go. Um, Australian butcher is closer. So they get my meat money. Um, All right, Tracy says she learned to prep from the Doomsday Prepper shows. Her prep room has saved them many times. Her husband works in construction, so what's not always available. She converted a study into a fully stocked shop. Stop, stop shop. Well, that's what her family says. Oh, what she, um, she worked hard to build up her stockpile and loves it. I love my stockpile too, Tracy. And yes. Um, I someone asked a couple of weeks ago whether I was a prepper or survivalist. Um, I don't think I'm either, but I I love my stockpile and well done. And you understand perfectly the benefit of having it for when there's no income. You can still eat. You can still clean your teeth. You can still clean your house. Yeah. Okay. Chris Miller, where can I? Chris is asking where she can buy sausage milk in. Bulk. I'm not sure where you are, Chris, but I get mine from Australian Butcher Store. There's one in Barone, there's one in Dandenong, there's one, there's another one somewhere. Um, Hannah reminded me that Tasman Meats um, sometimes had bulk sausage mints. Now, they're all over the place. Oh, actually, I think it's um, Berwick is the other Australian Butcher Store. Um, they moved into the old Tasman store, I think. So that's where I buy it from. You might be able to go to a local butcher 
and ask if he can do you a bulk deal on sausage mints. Your small local strip store, strip shopping centre, butchers often have really good deals. If you go in and ask and talk to them, explain what you want, they're really helpful, full of knowledge. They're so knowledgeable and so helpful. And you don't have to buy the expensive cuts from them. So ask him about sausage mints. I know um, our local strip butcher, when I was looking for real suet to make the Christmas pudding, and it had to be uh, the fruit mints and not the packet suet that's got all flour and stuff in it, but real suet. I went to our local butcher and he didn't have it, but he got it for me and it was really cheap. It was about $3 for a kilo and it freezes. So I've got suet for the next gazillion years. So ask at your local butcher if you don't have an Australian butcher store or Tasman close by. But, yeah, from a butcher, supermarkets, I don't think, would do a bulk deal for you in sausage mints. Yeah. Um, Lorraine S. No. Um, Australian butcher stores, Victorian, so is Tasman. Uh, there's a good butcher at... I've uh, forgotten, not Canterbury, not Campbelltown, uh, south, southwest of Sydney, southwest suburbs, and it slipped to my mind. I'm so sorry. But there's a good butcher out there somewhere. But ask around. Go on Cheapskate's Chatter and ask where the butcher stores are, where the good butchers are for your area. And people will know and they will happily share and then it's there, it's somewhere you can save the place so you'll always be able to find it. I'm getting ginormous wind, double-handed helicopter type wind-ups tonight. Okay, so. Ooh, they sound good too, Margarita. Mm. Yum. We love, we love feta triangles and spinach and ricotta triangles. Okay. All right, I shall go. I'm getting the wind up. Um, Lorraine S, Alicia B's just come. Ivan's, Ivan's Butcher in Chester Hill. There you go. Perfect, if you're down that way. Um, somewhere close by. Okay, I'm going. Thank you so much. Remember to give us a thumbs up down the bottom. That would be really, really helpful. Subscribe if you haven't. By all means, if you think this is going to be helpful, someone share the share the link to the video and jump on Facebook on Cheapskates Chatter and join the conversation. I'll see you on Thursday night in the kitchen. Something yummy for Easter. Yum, because Easter's just like Christmas. You just got to have treats. Only twice a year, you just got to have treats. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed it. I think Hannah has too. I shall see you all later.